please, when you're ready, go ahead and begin. Thank you, Warren. I appreciate the invitation to be able to speak to you tonight about a subject that's near and dear to my heart, uh, Acadian history and culture. Uh, what you see on your screen is the cover of our latest book. My wife, Mary Heron and I uh, published this in 2019 and it was launched in Canada at the World Acadian Reunion, which is held every five years. There's a lot to be told about this cover. What you see is the first group of Cajuns that ever returned to their native homeland in Nova Scotia since they were deported in 1755. So they were photographed getting onto a train in Lafayette for a 17 day, 3000 mile trip for the 175th anniversary of the Acadian deportation. The man who organized this is at the bottom in the center with a little straw hat, Senator Dudley J. LeBlanc, better known for the founder of the alcoholic elixir known as Hadakal. But he was launching this as an effort to unseat Governor Huey Long, who had just been elected in 1928. If you look at the lower right-hand corner, you'll see part of a sign that says, Dud Governor. And he and Long had become bitter enemies over a dispute over the appointment of a man to the Public Service Commissioner. And he had put the word out to all the Cajun communities in South Louisiana to send to him the prettiest girl in town, and he would make her evangeline and make her a queen and take her on this fabulous trip in the depths of the depression. The women had just been granted the right to vote. We had total economic chaos in Louisiana. We were still recovering from the disastrous 1927 flood. And here he was hosting 25 beauties from towns as far as Sulphur, Louisiana, all the way to, to Thibodeau. And that was going to be the basis of his political support as he was going to run for governor. They were accompanied by eight men, three of whom were priests. Interestingly, there were no female chaperones for this trip. We were given a diary and a scrapbook that was kept by one of the girls who made this trip. She lived to be 104 years old. She's in the upper tier to the right and she has the town of Baton Rouge draped across her evangeline costume. Corinne Broussard, who had been born in, Bat in Brobridge, had gotten a job with the Manship family, owners of the Advocate at that time, and she was one of their secretaries. And so they sponsored her. And in return, they did a lot of newspaper articles about the trip, which of course were all contained in her scrapbook and diary. The cost that each girl had to pay for the trip was $250. That covered everything, but it was a trip of a lifetime. And it's shown in this book, which we call Seeking the Acadian Nation. And it's based upon her diary. So Mary and I struggled with how to present a diary as a book. We're all familiar with the diary of Anne Frank, but basically that book is a reproduction of the diary, nothing more. And the reader is left with a lot of questions as to what she's referring to. So we decided to tell Corinne Broussard's story. We would tell the history of how this came to be, what impact this trip had on Cajun culture, and what were the reper repercussions from it. So the book is basically Acadian history, 
the return of Cajuns in 1930, the reconnection of Cajuns of Louisiana with Acadians of the world, and the resulting Acadian Renaissance, which started in the 60s and featuring some of the most important individuals. So, There's Lauren. Yes. On here. Nineteen thirty diary. Corinne Broussard. Next. So I had my son Andy who's an architect and graphic designer, plot their trip to give you a visual representation of the audacity of trying this trip, pulling this off. It was unbelievable, the planning that went in, because at every stop, we indicate where they spent the night. They stopped in New York, in Boston, in Washington. They were hosted at the White House by President Herbert Hoover who spent an entire afternoon with them. They stayed at the nicest hotels in New York, Boston, Philadelphia, and they ended up in Nova Scotia where they were hosted for many nights in the homes of Acadians. Next. We'll now go through a very quick summary of Acadian history. The Acadians were recruited for a commercial venture to set up the very first colony in North America in 1604, 16 years before the pilgrims dropped anchor in Plymouth. The Acadians were already there. They came from the area in central west of France around Brittany area and Normandy. And they were picked because of their terrific working skills. Many of these Acadian men were experienced with harvesting salt. So they had a very, very good skill set in dealing with tides, which will serve them well once they get to Nova Scotia, which had the highest tides in the world. Next. Nova Scotia is like a giant number seven and it's attached by the Chinicto Peninsula to what is today New Brunswick, Canada. So they settled in Port Royal, which was a little secluded area and set up the first settlement by a man led by Champlain. Champlain, who was a great explorer and very skilled and is considered the father of New France by many historians. At first, there were no women or children there. It wasn't until, the 19, until 1736 that the first group of women were able to go there and really start the population of the colony. But before they arrived, they were many relationships that developed between the, the Acadian men and the Mi'kmaq or Native American women. So many children came out of those relationships and most Acadians who have had their DNA tested prove that we have this connection to the First Nation people and the tribe which still exists today on seven different plantations uh, plantations within Nova Scotia are called the Mi'kmaq people. Next. This is an artist representation of the first settlement at Port Royal, which was nicknamed the Habitation. This slide shows the relationship between the Acadians and the Mi'kmaq. Their friendship 
and how it benefited the Acadians, it cannot be overestimated. And it's interesting for us to compare how they became friendly and helped by the First Nation people. And this is in great contrast to what happened with the pilgrims. The pilgrims did not seek out the relationship with the Native Americans. They basically tried to destroy them. And it was, they had a much more difficult time establishing their settlements. The Acadians immediately took all of the suggestions from the Mi'kmaq, including where to settle, where to fish, how to control the tides, where to farm, and they were prospering and very, very successful very quickly. But that set off a competition between the pilgrims and the Acadians because the area called Acadie that they settled went as far as Southern Maine near Boston. And so those two entities, one controlled by the French Catholics, the other controlled by the Protestant English, that set off a great, great dispute for the next 150 years, they were in competition with each other and in constant struggle and battles. And it was in fact, the grandchildren of the pilgrims deported the grandchildren of the first Acadians. Next. The man who led the deportation was Charles Lawrence. I don't have the time to go into the details of how that came to be, suffice it to say. They had the military might to take the lands away that those Acadians had prospered on and settled for over 150 years. And in 1755, Winslow was a colonel in Boston and he, in conjunction with Lawrence, who was the acting governor in Halifax, Nova Scotia, planned the secret expulsion of the Acadians. This plan did not come from London. Interestingly, it came from Boston. It was based in this hatred of the Protestants against the French Catholics and the jealousy of the prosperity that the Acadians had developed. One example, the Acadians were so healthy, they were doubling their population every 20 years. This was in stark contrast to what was happening with the pilgrims that were struggling just to maintain the fecundancy rate or the survival of their children. And there was a great fear in Boston that this overpopulation would cause the Acadians to overrun the pilgrims in the New England colonies. And so that was the impotence. It was basically, let's take the lands because we had the military force. And so Lawrence, with the help of Winslow, recruited 2,000 militia out of New England, and they marched to deport the Acadians. Next. This is a pen and ink sketch showing the horrific battles that went on. There were approximately 15,000 Acadians in the colony. The name had been changed to Nova Scotia but the Acadians had been granted the status of British subjects and they were tricked by telling all the men they had to report in their churches at three o'clock in the afternoon on September 5th, 1755. As soon as the men and boys, by the way, age 10 and above were considered men, the doors were locked. It was announced that they were prisoners of war. They were forfeiting all of the possessions to the British crown and they would be deported to the British colonies because they were British subjects. They couldn't be sent back to France. They were going to be used as indentured servants to the British. And of the 15,000, approximately 5,000 died. They were either killed, they died of starvation, disease, or shipwreck. On December 13th, eight hundred Acadians perished when three ships went down with very few survivors. 
So approximately a third perished. Approximately a third were deported to the British colonies all the way down as far south as Savannah, Georgia. But a third managed to escape deportation and ran into the woods and were helped by their friends, the Micmac, to survive as long as they could. Next. The horror depicted in this pen and ink sketch shows the boats arriving to bring them to the ports along the English seaboard. Families were separated in a deliberate attempt to make it more difficult for Acadians to reunite, making them more likely to remain in the British colonies. Next. This shows a very convoluted map of what took place following the deportation. The French and Indian War lasted from 1755 until 1763. It was the first world war and it was the battle for the control of North America. The war was ended and Britain won when they defeated the French, the Battle of Quebec in 1759. The Treaty of Paris was signed in 1763 and everyone was allowed to go home. Everyone was allowed to go home except the Acadians. Thus, clear proof the deportation was to take their lands from them and to eth ethnically cleanse that portion of North America from the French. So those Acadians that had been deported could go anywhere but home. They could not go back to Acadie. And that caused the first group led by Beausoleil Broussard to depart from Halifax in November of 1764, bringing the first Acadians to Louisiana voluntarily to, to actually bring their culture and replant their culture in Louisiana, which they were told was still a French colony. Unbeknownst to them, as we know, the colony had been transferred to Spain secretly. And once they arrived there, they were greeted by Spanish and French caretakers. They were so well received that they decided they were going to stay, even though it was a Spanish colony. They were given lodging at a point in Algiers in warehouses for four months while they recuperated. Once they were able to row boats, they were brought to the area along the Bayou Teche near St. Martinville, near Lauraville, just north of New Iberia. And they were given all the lands they could settle in 10 years. Spanish land grants available to them, they thought they had died and gone to heaven because it was just a new Acadia and they saw the chance to continue their culture. This first group was so well received, other Acadians who had been trying to disperse and settle in other portions of the world, including the Falkland Islands, French Guiana, Britain, Quebec, the French West Indies started to come to Louisiana. And over the next 30 years, over 3,000 Acadians came to join that first group. Next. This represents the initial settlement, which was called the Atakapa Territory because it was inhabited by the Atakapa Native Americans. They were reputed to be man eaters and they kept out pioneers by every year or so eating two or three pioneers, letting the rest go back. And so the word spread and nobody wanted to come settle in Acadiana. But of course, because the Acadians had become very close to the Mi'kmaq, they were not fearful of the Atakapa and settled in South Central Louisiana and prospered. Within one generation, the children of the first settlers were prosperous and 
healthy and wealthy. And Beausoleil's son, Amand Broussard, his succession is on record in St. Martin Parish Courthouse. He died a very wealthy cattleman owning scores of slaves. Next. We will go rather quickly in the next group of slides, since now we are in Louisiana, they are managing to row across the Atchafalaya Basin, heading for their new homeland, which they call Nouvelle Acadie, or New Acadia. Next. Here we would see a typical interior of an Acadian home in Louisiana. They were very well known, the women were, for their homespun cotton done by the spinning wheel shown there. Next. Another factor which cannot be overemphasized is the connection between Acadians and cattle. Many of them had been cattle men in Nova Scotia. And as soon as they arrived in New Orleans, they learned there was a shortage of meat in the city because the cattle grounds had been what's considered the Florida parishes of Louisiana were still controlled by England. And so they had to reach out to the West parishes to bring in cattle. And so the Acadians made a bargain with a large owner of cattle named Dotri. It was a cattle sharecropping contract signed in New Orleans. And it's a one page document. Basically they were provided each family with several cows and one bull. And they were required to give half of the offspring to Dotri. So it was the demand for meat that brought the Acadians to the prairie lands of Acadiana. Next. I love to tell my friends from Texas, a hundred years before the cowboys in Texas were bringing cows on the Chisholm Trail to Kansas City to market, the Acadians were bringing cattle to market in New Orleans through the Chafalaya swamps. They would swim the cattle through the swamps to get them to the market. So we're gonna quickly go to the Civil War, a very important part of America's country history, but very little impact on an Acadian. Very few of them had a dog in that fight. They didn't have the plantations to protect. They were basically small farmers. And this is a pen and ink sketch showing an Acadian farmer conscripted to fight for the South you notice he's chained to the tree because he, he doesn't want to be there in the first place. And they often deserted and went home at their first opportunity. Next. Women in the 1800s, again, the spinning wheel. Next. Up. Another pen and ink sketch, I find this one interesting. It was published in the most popular magazine of the day in the late 1800s out of New York called Harper's Weekly. And it was a story which denigrated the Acadians. You would never depict a woman's bust line as you see here, especially you would never show a woman with her legs spread. So the artists was, were trying to show the Acadian men and women as low class, trash. Why? We were French speakers in an American country that was looking down on us. And it's something that Cajuns have fought throughout their history. But this particular pen and ink sketch really hones it in very clearly where the man stands above 
lecherously looking at the women, almost as though they are prostitutes. Next. Next. I guess we've lost connection. Hello? Hey, Warren, can you hear me? Hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, uh, my computer has frozen, unfortunately. If you're able to continue talking, I'll do my best to get it back working. Okay, no problem. There we go. Look at that magic. <laughs> so let's go through these fairly quickly because it, I wanted the uh, audience to understand when this trip was getting planned to go to Canada, what it looked like in Louisiana in 1930. You can flip through these next. Large families, 22 children, Next. Prized homespun Acadian blankets. If you have one of these in your attic, they're very valuable today. Next. Next. Music was very important. The language was kept alive in the music. It never died. When it was against the law to speak French in schools from 1916 until the law was changed in 1968 and changed in the Constitution of 1974, it's the music that kept the language alive. Next. 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 And so here we come to the beginning of the French Renaissance in 1968 with the creation of the state agency, Council for Development of French in Louisiana, led by Congressman Jimmy DiMaggio and the announcing to the public that the adoption of the first Acadian flag, which was adopted by the state legislature in 1974 as the official flag of Acadiana. But that was so important because with, without Codafil, the language is lost. And it's Codafil that eventually got French immersion into schools and it's the future hope of saving of the French language in Louisiana. I had the honor of serving as Codafil president for 16 years under four governors. And today, French immersion is incredibly popular throughout the state. We cannot furnish enough teachers for the demand that students want to participate in these incredible programs. Next. Judge Joseph A. Bro was a man that very few people know about, but he graduated from Tulane. He made a lot of money practicing law in New Iberia, founded the first bank, never had children, was a very, very philanthropic individual, donated lots of money to Charity Hospital, a building is named after him, to Tulane University, to LSU, and he became Chief Justice of the Louisiana Supreme Court. But the reason he's important, he's the man that reconnected Cajuns with the Acadians of the world. He started going up to Quebec, to Paris, to Halifax, to Montreal. He had the money, he had the desire to do it. And for 15 years, he attended their conferences and brought their 
lecturers here, students here. They eventually created the uh, Broussard Hall, thanks to Hugh Long, appropriating $30,000, which was a French immersion co college campus at LSU. And so he finally retired in the late 20s, and the mantle was picked up by Dudley J. LeBlanc, who put together that 1930 trip. But this man, Bro, was really the father of French Renaissance. Next. Now, a few pictures of Dudley LeBlanc. He's a uh, graduate of SLI here in uh, 1912. Next. The Evangeline culture with all the dresses came from the famous poem penned by Longfellow in 1848. If it hadn't been for Longfellow writing Evangeline, I dare say there would be no Cajun culture, no Acadian culture anywhere in the world. Because after the deportation from 1755 until Longfellow publishes the poem, it was called the century of silence. No one spoke about, wrote about, or sung anything about the Acadian people. We were lost in history until the poem was published, it became the number one best-selling book in the world for 13 years. And everybody wanted to read it and they all wanted to know who these Acadian people were. So you get the popularity, all the girls and women wanted to be Evangeline and they started the Mardi Gras. And of course we have our King Gabriel, Queen Evangeline. And that's what Dudley was playing off of to make this big run against Huey Long. Next. I mentioned briefly the flood of 27. Here we have a group of Evangeline girls invited to the inauguration of Herbert Hoover in Washington, DC to thank Hoover. He was in charge of the recovery of the great flood of 1927. And because of his excellent recovery skills, it made him president of the United States. But unfortunately with the depression hitting, he was totally run out of office. He was humiliated by Roosevelt in the upcoming election. But you see here, they were so popular, they were invited to the presidential inauguration of, of uh, who? Next. Another Evangeline girl depicted, she was on the trip along with Corrine Broussard. Her diary has been donated to the Center for Louisiana Studies and Archives in Lafayette. Next. Here we have Dudley LeBlanc being greeted by President Herbert Hoover with the 25 Evangeline girls. Next. I'm not now going to show you a few pictures that come directly from Corrine's diary. This was Corrine in her flapper dress. She later became a promoter of French culture throughout the world. Next. Another picture of Corrine from her diary. One of the things I found quite interesting as you read Corrine's diary. Once they crossed into Canada, they started drinking alcohol every day because it was still prohibition. Many of these girls had never tasted champagne and they had a party for every lunch and every dinner and they had a ball and they were hesitant to come back to the United States where alcohol was still prohibited. Next. Here we have Corrine in her evangeline dress on the grounds in Grand Prix, Nova Scotia, where her ancestors had been deported 175 years before. She was a direct sixth generation descendant of Beausoleil Broussard, who brought the first Acadians to Louisiana. Next. Again, this was her official picture, and she was obviously 
highly respected by her entourage because she was voted as the spokesman for the group and was the one who gave interviews to radio whenever that was necessary. Next. Again, a picture of her later in her life. She later died in New Iberia at age 104. And fortunately, her son graciously donated to our Acadian Museum her entire collection of memorabilia from that trip. Next. Next. And here's a beautiful picture of Corrine on her 100th birthday. She was still entertaining. She played the ukulele and she would still go to nursing homes and entertain people while singing and playing her ukulele. Some of you may have heard about her famous brother. His name was Senator Sam Broussard of New Iberia. And he was recruited by General Eisenhower to be in the inner circle and helped to plan the D-Day invasion because of his ability to speak French to the comrades in France. And uh, he was one of the founders of Codafield. Next. These trips were so successful. Dudley later brought girls in 1936 and again in 1963, where they were hosted by President Roosevelt and finally by President John F. Kennedy a few weeks before he was assassinated. But this particular group is a group of girls from Canada who came to visit Louisiana in 1946 and they were hosted at the Capitol and they sang with Governor Jimmy Davis. Next. And here we have Dudley again representing Louisiana on an international scale in 1966 He's in Belle Ile, Mayer, France, for the commemoration of the 200th anniversary of the Acadian deportation. Dudley went on to make a fortune in promotion of How Call, and he went on the show with Groucho Marx, You Beth Your Life. And Groucho supposedly asked him, well, I saw it. He actually asked Dudley. He said, what will How to Call do for me, Senator? And Cousin Dud replied, I don't know what it'll do for you, Groucho, but for me, it did five million last year. So he was making a fortune. He was spending as much money in marketing how to call as Coca-Cola was spending by putting on some of the grandest shows all over the United States. Next. And that concludes our presentation. I will be more than happy to discuss any of these aspects with any of you. Many of these images came from Dr. Shane Bernard's book, Cajuns and the Arcadian Ancestors, which has been translated into French and is used in Louisiana schools to teach children their Arcadian history. Thank you, Warren. That was Really appreciated, really wonderful lecture. I'll open the floor to questions. We have 10 to 12 minutes for any questions. If you're not, if you're online, please simply unmute yourself uh, or send me a message to do so. Okay, am I, am I muted now? No, you're not, Warren. We okay, can hear you. good. Or how about this? I'll unmute everyone and see who has something to say. <laughs> I don't know. Can you all hear me? Yes. OK. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm, I've, I've blocked my view. But anyway, I just wanted to mention that uh, very interesting talk. Uh, I enjoyed very much. It clearly focused on the, the Acadian settlement that was over in the southwest of Louisiana. But there was another whole you know, a contingent of, of Acadians has settled along uh, the uh, Bayou Lafourche and, and the Mississippi River just south of the, of the uh, what was called then the Lafourche de Cheramache. So I was just curious uh, if he, um, 
Warren could recommend uh, some books that maybe focus more on those Acadians, uh, just for those of us who whose roots are, you know, are planted along the Bayou Lafourche. Thanks for mentioning that. There's a very complicated settlement pattern. You're absolutely correct. The very, very first large group, however, settled in Acadiana on the Bayou Tesh. The, the groups that came primarily from Maryland, two shiploads came with about 400 Acadians about two years later, about 17, 1769, 68. They primarily settled along the Bayou Terrebonne, Bayou Lafourche areas. And so over the next 30 years until 1785, you had different boatloads coming at different times, settling at different locations. Now, if you go to our website, acadianmuseum.com, we have published eight books. The I'm book sorry, that we published- would you repeat the, the website address again? Sure. Acadianmuseum.com. Ah, okay. And on there, we have eight books we've published. And the book that you would be most interested in would be the one we did five years ago, which discusses all of the different settlement patterns along with maps throughout the state and the world where Acadians are settled. It's called Acadia Then and Now. It's a much uh, more in-depth discussion than this last book that we did. Mm -hmm. uh, so for a Christmas present, and I can ship something out. If anybody is interested in any of our books, I can ship them directly out of my Lafayette Law Office. And you can reach me by email through the museum website, or Frank can give you my email. And if any of you would like to get our monthly newsletter, uh, we will do that if you simply send us your email address, which we just issued one yesterday, in fact. Uh, one of my trick questions about where Acadians are settled, uh, I asked this to people, where do you think more Broussards live? <laughs> people usually say, well, Abbeville, Lafayette, Brobridge. The correct answer is Houston, Texas. It's probably <laughs> more Acadians in Texas than Louisiana. And that's a whole other story where they migrated to work in the uh, factories after between World War I and World War II. So we have a very, very, very interesting convoluted history. It's tantalizing, it's frustrating, it's exhilarating, but it's just amazing to know that we created this culture in North America and we still exist to this day. That's very, very unusual mm -hmm. because most ethnicities, most ethnic groups came to America to become Americans. We didn't, we were forced here. So we transplanted the culture that we had created in that colony far away, Akadi. Let me ask you one other thing. Uh, what, how much information do you have or where can you find information about people who came down the Mississippi River Valley as opposed to coming by ship uh, down to Louisiana? Uh, the, the colony of Quebec, when it was founded, when it was in its heyday, if you look at a map of North America before the French and Indian War, you'll be shocked to see that the French controlled 90% of North America. Emails the and English taxes. only controlled Find along it. the Atlantic seaboard. Everything else was controlled by France. So Quebec was considered New France and it extended into Louisiana. So Louisiana was part of Quebec before the French and Indian War. So they had long been this trade mm -hmm. going on. Marquette and Joliet and these trappers, they were coming down long before the Acadians got here. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are many publications. All of these towns along the Mississippi were French. St. Louis was Saint Louis. Uh, Detroit was Detroit. I mean, right. so in our book, Acadia Then and Now, 
we have articles written by historians discussing all of the settlements along the Mississippi River, including Michigan. All right, Warren, we have a question from Paul, I believe. Yeah. Hey, Warren, what a fascinating talk. My wife and I spend the summers in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia. So we've gotten to learn a bit about the other side of the story. And we visited for the first time Grand Pre. What a, what a place that is. And I would encourage everybody that gets to Nova Scotia to go there and, and see it. But I'm wondering whether you've done any work with the history of the, the music, uh, Cajun music. Because in Nova Scotia, when we listen to the local music, uh, there's a strong tradition. And I think I hear it's a, it's a fusion of Irish music and, and, and French music. And I wonder uh, if that made it there. And that was the uh, basis of what we hear in uh, when we listen to Zydeco. But I'm just wondering if you've traced, uh, traced that history at all in your work on, the, work on the Acadians. Again, the book Acadia Then and Now has several chapters on music written by PhD musicologists that discuss that in great, great detail. But hmm. I will tell you, the only instrument that we know came from the Acadians to Louisiana was the fiddle. Hmm. The guitar was brought in by the Spanish, and it was the Germans who came and brought the accordion. Mm -hmm. So uh, our, our Cajun and Zotico music is like our gumbo. It's just a whole melange. It's a mixture of all the, it's just, it's just so symbolic of the mixture of all the cultures. Yeah. And you know, I, I, when I was a kid, I'd, I'd go to New Orleans and you know, in the sixties, you couldn't find a Cajun restaurant or you would never hear Cajun Zotico. I'll tell you what changed it, the French Renaissance and the World's Fair in 1984. Mm -hmm. See, that opened up the world to Cajun and Creole culture. That created mm -hmm. Paul Proudhon. It created mm -hmm. George Rodrigue, the artist. Exposed it created it musicians too. like Zachary Richard. You know, wow. it, it, it opened us up to the world. I mean, that was the boom right there. That's what did it, mm -hmm. the World's Fair. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Fiddling is huge in Nova Scotia. Sure. It is the dominant form of music there. Yes. Now, and you mentioned Grand Pre, and that's sort of the largest village, and it's it's where Longfellow set his fictitious poem, Evangeline. But he, he, he was accurate in his history in the poem. But what we're doing, one of the things I should have mentioned is that we still don't know where the first Canadian settlement was on the Bayou Tents. And we started a search with the archaeology department of UL Lafayette in 2012. And we formed a committee and we've donated uh, $300,000 to the university. Every year we, we give them a, a grant and it's to locate. And I will tell you, we know approximately where it is and it's right near the town of Laurelville where the first settlement We've hit on artifacts dating to the right time, but we just haven't hit on the, the load star. You know, we don't have the enough mass to say it's right here, but we know we're right close in the right area. It's called the New Acadia Project. Great, thank you. Thank you, Warren. Maybe we have uh, two minutes. Any short questions out there? One more short question. Do. Steven. Yes, um, Warren, I know that it was considered uh, illegal, but when the British put the Acadians under indentures in 1755, there had to be a, a legal document. Are there any copies that are still in existence? And do you know for what term of the indenture it was? For Was it like 10 years or five years? The best comparison I could make would be what the United States did to Japanese Americans in World War II with their internment camps. It was very similar. See, the Acadians were non-enemy combatants. They were convicted of nothing. They were just mm -hmm. basically thrown in jails or thrown on boats and brought to places and dumped. And they had to fend for themselves. So they themselves were not allowed to travel. But they weren't prisoners. They weren't in jail, but they just couldn't leave. They had to just do the, the work that no one else wanted to do to survive. 
but the contracts were signed for their children. It was the children that would put indentured servitude mm. for five year periods. Okay. And we do have documents chronologizing all of that. And another good example to think about what happened to the Acadians would be like what America is doing in Guantanamo Bay with Al Qaeda. These mm -hmm. men in prison are non enemy combatants convicted of nothing. We just put them in jail. What are we doing to them? We're allowing them to go anywhere except home. And that's a, a nice parallel of what the British did with the Acadians. They just didn't want them to go home. They let them go anywhere. And about one third came to Louisiana. About one third went to Quebec. And about one third went back to France. That's a very general mm -hmm. way of looking at it. But many ended up staying in New England. Okay. Hey, Warren, uh, just a quick uh, thank you for, uh, for this wonderful lecture uh, for the Roundtable Club. We really appreciate it. Uh, and a little add on to uh, your answer to Philip. Philip, I have a copy of the book that uh, Warren wrote and uh, was actually put out in 2004 dealing with uh, the life of Joseph Broussard. If, if you like that, uh, I'll get it to you. But uh, we really appreciate what you've done. And I'd also like to put in another plug for uh, Warren's books are wonderfully written. And if you haven't been to the uh, Acadian Museum in Erath, uh, I, I really recommend you finding a time to do that and give Warren a call and uh, he'll, gi he'll give you a tour that you will, um, will always remember. So uh, uh, Warren, thank you very much for doing this. We sure appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Very Merci beaucoup. Appreciate the invitation to be with you. I've enjoyed it. Hope to see you soon. All right. Thank you, Warren. That's a wrap for this evening. We can't thank you enough for your time and information and knowledge. Uh, for everyone else on the call, this is the last lecture of the fall or winter series. We'll be back in January. Be in touch, monitor your emails, and we will see you then. Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy New Year's, and so forth. Good night. Good Stay night. safe. Bye-bye. <laughs> The wrap. No. It's, this computer froze for a while. I thought I'd have to do the whole thing by memory, but we got it going again. Woo. Need a glass of water now. It's crazy.